Hi everyone. So today we'll be working on June 2014, number one. All right. So first of all, the heat of neutralization can be determined by measuring the temperature change when various volumes of acid are added with a base. So this is what we call a thermometric titration. All right. We are adding small quantities of hydrochloric acid to potassium hydroxide, which is your base. All right. So when acid is added to the base, we have a rise in temperature. And this can be seen um, as we add our hydrochloric acid. So if you notice here, the temperature goes up to 38 and then it goes back down. So using the data from this table, we have to plot a graph of temperature against volume of acid. All right. So when I did that, I got some points that were going up and some points that were going down. One of the points were going down. Um, let me just zoom out a bit so you can see this. All right. So the points that are going up, what we normally do, we draw a best fit. We draw two straight lines of best fit, one through the points where the temperature is increasing and one through the points where the temperature is decreasing. And the point of intersection of the two lines, this is called the neutralization point. So this is our neutralization point, which corresponds to 25 cm cube of HCl, right? So it takes 25 cm cube of acid to neutralize our base, which is the answer here for number two. Now, as I said, there is a temperature change in the reaction. We are looking at the highest temperature reached versus the initial temperature. The temperature change will be 38, take away 27, which works out to be 11 degrees Celsius. Very simple calculation so far. Okay. Now we are going to calculate the heat change at the point of neutralization for the reaction. Now heat change is calculated by using the mass of the um, the mass of both of the solutions times specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. Now the mass of our solutions used would be the initial mass of the base, which is the potassium hydroxide, plus the mass of the hydrochloric acid used to neutralize that base. All right, so we are only using this 25 cm cube of hydrochloric acid not all of them okay remember heat of neutralization we are only um, considering the volume of acid until there is no further heat change okay when we work this out I got um, 2310 joules which can be converted to 2.31 kilojoules they did not ask this information but this is um, actually an exothermic reaction because the temperature increased all right just for your knowledge okay so we are looking at part b now part b sam conducted a series of experiments to investigate the effects of various factors on the rate of reaction between magnesium and one molar iron three chloride solution all right so this definitely um, tells you that this is a rates experiment and they are telling us um, we are using two strips of magnesium one um, 5 cm strip and the other strip has been cut up into smaller pieces right um, immediately we can say that the particle size has been altered um, by extension that also means the surface area has been altered so a suitable aim for this experiment to me would be to investigate the rate of reaction between magnesium and iron chloride by varying surface area. All right. If you had anything else different, please let me know. All right. But this um, is basically what they are doing in this experiment. And um, if you had anything else, just let me know. All right. Describe what would happen to the contents of beaker A after 30 seconds. 
right so for this part now I just want to show you a quick video all right so this is magnesium metal and we have iron chloride solution iron chloride is a yellow solution you should try and remember that okay iron chloride iron 3 chloride is a yellow solution when we place the magnesium in there it immediately starts to react and look at the color change it's turning brown all right so clearly this um, is a displacement reaction all right it went from being silver in color to being brown in color and this brown color shows you the formation of the iron the iron is being displaced from the solution onto the metal all right so what happens in beaker A after 30 seconds now remember beaker A is the one that we cut up into smaller pieces okay magnesium is higher than iron in the reactivity series remember we did this in the previous class and if you look at the position of magnesium it is higher than iron which means it will displace iron from solution and iron will be deposited somewhere. So either it will be deposited on the magnesium metal or to the bottom. Now remember, beaker A is the one that we cut up into smaller pieces. So this will take place a lot faster. What is a suitable ionic equation for this reaction? Firstly, when we are doing ionic equations, I like to write the full equation and break it down just to be sure, right? So this. Um, can also be considered a recap for writing ionic equations. We have to know our reactants and our products. Our reactants were given, which would be magnesium and iron 3 chloride. Our, react our products would be magnesium chloride because magnesium took the place of iron and iron got kicked out of his house. So um, now that we know both the products and the reactants, we proceed to balance the equations. All right. I did forget to put the two here. This is not supposed to be in purple. It's supposed to be in blue because it's MgCl2. All right. These are the um, numbers we added in front in order to balance the equation. And for ionic equations, what we do is we split up those compounds that are in the aqueous state, which would be iron chloride and magnesium chloride right so when we split up well magnesium stays the same because this is in a solid state right we have two iron three plus ions right we have six chloride ions because it's two cl3 that makes it six ions right three magnesium cations and again we have six chlorine ions this iron here um, we don't split this up right because it's in its solid state what is repeated on both left and right side in this case it's the chlorine ions and these will be considered spectator ions and we have to remove them right what is left would be this um, equation here and this is what i am writing on top here okay so we are left with three magnesium solid plus two fe3 plus aqueous to give us three mg2 plus aqueous and two fe solid two marks for one you are using the correct state symbols and two you are um, you have a balance equation how would the contents of beaker B be different from the contents of beaker A after each is left for 30 seconds? So we know that A is reacting faster than in B. All right, so we will see products forming faster than that in B. All right, so our products would be um, magnesium chloride and iron. Magnesium chloride is a clear solution. So it's going to become uh, more pale yellow, right? It's going to look like it's more dilute as it's being, um, as the reaction is going on. And you'll see more brown spots of iron. In B now, um, yes, the reaction is taking place. However, it's not as fast as A. 
so your magnesium chloride is not forming as fast as A, therefore B will not be as pale as A. All right, we started off with yellow, right? And it's getting more yellow. Sorry, it's getting less yellow with time. But A will, because it's taking place at a slower rate, it's going to be less pale than A and less brown deposits of iron. And the reason for that is because magnesium had a larger surface area, the reaction will take place faster and the products will be formed faster. Whereas with B, B had a slower rate of reaction due to a smaller surface area and therefore less products formed with time. Next question. Some students were required to determine whether an unknown substance contained the sulfite ion. So here we have a setup, one stoppered flask with a delivery tube, right? Um, here we have acid and sulfite. When we react these two things together, the product, one of the products will be sulfur dioxide gas. Sulfur dioxide gas smells like burnt matches. Right? That's how you can identify that gas if you are taking a whiff of it. In this case, it's being bubbled into a solution called Y, and we are not sure what Y is. Right? More than likely, Y will be a identifier solution to identify this gas. It's a confirmatory test for sulfur dioxide. So how can we identify Y? There are two reagents that we use to identify sulfur dioxide gas, all right? That can be either acidified potassium dichromate or acidified potassium permanganate. So what changes would you expect to see if this was potassium dichromate? Potassium dichromate is originally orange, and when the sulfur dioxide is bubbled into it, it turns green. If you had the answer for part one as potassium permanganate, it will start off as being purple and as sulfur dioxide is being added or bubbled into the solution, it's going to turn colorless after some time. Why is that? Well, firstly, sulfur dioxide is a product of acid and sulfites, right? When it is bubbled into Y, potassium Dichromate is an oxidizing agent, meaning potassium permanganate, sorry, potassium dichromate will be reduced, right? And because it is being reduced, its color change will be from orange to green. Similarly, if you are using potassium permanganate as your answer, um, it's the same explanation, basically, if using Potassium permanganate, which is an oxidizing agent, it will be reduced, so its color change will be from purple to colorless. All right, so these are oxidizing agents that can be used to identify sulfur dioxide gas. How would you modify the experiment to confirm the presence of carbonate instead of the sulfide ion? Now, if you listen carefully in the background, the ice cream truck is passing, right? Um, calcium hydroxide can be used to identify the gas produced. What is the gas produced? It is acid plus carbonate will give us carbon dioxide gas. This is one of the tests that we did in the lab. The test for carbon dioxide gas is uh, we bubble it into lime water. If it, is, if it turns lime water cloudy, um, that, that will confirm the presence of carbon dioxide gas. All right, so that is it for question one, total 25 marks. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Okay, so I just thought to throw this in. Um, this is the reaction between potassium dichromate, uh, that dichromate and sulfur dioxide. So it starts off as being orange and the sulfur dioxide is being bubbled in there. And you see in a turning green as a, um, the potassium dichromate is being reduced. All right, so that's basically what it looks like. 
Also, this is what it would look like if the sulfur dioxide was bubbled into potassium permanganate. Right? So it went from purple to colorless. Very beautiful reaction.